show of hands, how many out there uh, go to Disney World and use credit cards? Uh, it's everybody. So this makes what I'm about to say very, very important. I want to talk to you about some events and some trends and the basic structure of cyberspace that has created scores of unparalleled opportunities for a very spirited and talented group of adversaries ranging from script kiddies to state sponsor groups and even nations to prey in cyberspace and create physical destruction in the real world. What we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is a new Cold War and a race for cyber arms. The high, the low, the rich, the poor, the black, the white, the private sector, the public sector, academic institutions, everyone in this room is vulnerable to a cyber attack because of our dependency on technology from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep and every minute in between. Some people, when they go to sleep at night, yours truly, there's a little box by their bed, and it manages oxygen in and out of their bodies, and it sends a health report over radio frequency waves to the doctor's office, and the doctor will prescribe a treatment plan based off of that report, and that box is vulnerable to a cyber attack. But before we beat up on technology, we want to talk about the good it does in our lives. And over 40 years ago, the first message went from a computer at UCLA to a computer at Stanford, and the word was login, and only the first two letters made it before the system crashed, and they call that a success. And here we are today, over two billion users will use over nine billion devices and communicate 145 billion emails every single day. You could be standing anywhere in the world and type any question into Google search bar, and Google will use all kinds of sexy algorithms break your question down into a bunch of packets, hop all across cyberspace, find its way to Silicon Valley, California, find the answer in a back-end database, return it in the same manner, faster than the speed of light, and if it doesn't, you'll get mad and punch your keyboard. <laughs> and between Facebook and virtual world, they both represent over a billion users apiece. I quote General Alexander when he says, if that were a country, that'd be the third largest country in the world, China, India, and Facebook, a neticist of avatars. That is the largest voluntary endeavor in the world, ladies and gentlemen. And every single month, six billion mobile subscribers are passing over two exabytes of traffic. That's a two with 18 zeros followed behind it. I truly enjoy this technology in my life, but as a cybersecurity professional, I'm paranoid. I see the attack service getting bigger, and bigger and bigger. It's like shooting at a sitting duck, you can't miss. It's a breeding ground for adversaries to prey in cyberspace and create physical destruction in the real world. And what does that attack service look like for 2014? Every traditional crime you could ever imagine, every behavior, every personality is now being morphed into cyberspace. 300 million of our youth will become victims to sexual predators in cyberspace. One piece of malware will be created every 10 seconds. And 70% of the emails we get will come from robots, and they will be in the form of spam. And what are these vulnerabilities that I'm talking about? Or is it the basic structure space? Every device, a routable protocol, serves as an entry point into the United States. It serves as a proxy for anonymous action. It serves as a zombie for a distributive denial of service attack, another weapon on the cyberspace battlefield. And with the dawn of smart grid technology, intrusions are now going from wholesale to retail. Adversaries will take out control systems, but they'll go in your house and they'll take out your thermostats. And all the ones and zeros lack identification. They all look the same. Every file, every email, every message, every malicious code sent to take out the public utility system in New York City all looks the same. And only a talented individual and a small group of people can pull apart a data payload packet and say, this is not a good email. This is going to create physical destruction in the real world. And out of that small group of people, a majority of those guys are the bad actors. And because of the small group of people, because of the lack of identification, it might be your friend that you're speaking to in that chat room, your kids. It might be your friends that you've accepted on Facebook, your kids. It might be your colleague that you've accepted on LinkedIn, 
your kids. And because it might be, it's a good possibility that it is not. In an old Cold War, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and law enforcement agencies were able to stop contraband from coming into the United States. And for the KGB to get data out of the United States, they had to penetrate all kinds of barriers through land, sea, air, and space. And we were very good at stopping them. It led to the collapse of the USSR. A superpower got lost, and an old Cold War came to an end. But in a new Cold War, in a cyber domain, every switch, every computer, every router, with the dawn of smart grid technology, 200 million refrigerators, 9 billion devices, 6 billion mobile subscribers serve as entry points into the United States. You get a router from your internet service provider, plug it into your house, it does something called supernetting. And every device that connects to your access point thereafter becomes another entry point into the United States, another weapon on the cyberspace battlefield. In an old Cold War, a war that I was part of, it was the country that had the most troops, that were the best trained, that had the best weapons. Those were the ones that were going to win the next world war. They were called a superpower. But this is not the case in a new Cold War, a new Cold War we are all part of. It is a man with a keyboard. He has asymmetric capabilities. It is called a distributive denial of service attack. And to prove my point, when the Estonian government removed a statue out of a park that commemorated Russia's role in World War II, it was a man with a keyboard that crippled the entire country. And Estonia enjoyed their freedom from Russia. They enjoyed the statue being removed. But it was a man with a keyboard that got his point across. And they called that cyber hacktivism, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to tell you today it is called cyber warfare. Now, uranium ore in its crude and natural state, when taken out of the quarry, is useless to the world. But in a process called uranium enrichment, spun in centrifuges at a very constant rate of speed, you get something called yellow cake. When it's purified to levels of 5%, you get uranium that's suitable for electric. But when it's purified to levels of 90%, you get uranium that's suitable for nuclear use. We in the West and our allies, we fear the worst, suitability for World War III. But a very intelligent piece of malware called Stuxnet crawls around the world looking for a special controller that spins those centrifuges at a constant rate of speed. Now imagine that a young man goes into the club and he wants to dance with a beautiful young lady, but she's dancing with a group of girls. So he has to sneak into the group to eventually jump to the girl that he wants to dance with. Stuxnet did the same thing with Microsoft, didn't care about Microsoft. As a matter of fact, it never attacked Microsoft, but it snuck into that enclave, got onto a Microsoft machine, and jumped onto a controller gathered all the information about those centrifuges, and home to two, to two rogue servers stationed in Denmark and Malaysia. The target was a uranium enrichment plant located in Tanz, Iran, and the goal was to break those controllers, make the centrifuges spin out of control so the uranium would not be suitable for nuclear use. But this is what I care about, is these controllers. Okay? These controllers receive very calculated inputs and perform deterministic outputs for physical processes in the real world. They have very, very poor security. They're nothing like your laptops that you carry with you every day. As a matter of fact, your laptops have more security than these do. They have proprietary software, which means they don't play well in IT environments, despite the fact we put them in IT environments. They don't have any antiviruses, and they don't have any authentication or integrity of data. They receive a calculated input, but they don't authenticate where it came from to make sure it came from the right sender. And they don't check the data to make sure the data hasn't been tampered with. In my world, in the cybersecurity world, we call that bad. Now, these controllers are the center of gravity for what I call a deterministic computing environment, referred to as SCADA, Supervising Control and Data Acquisition. These SCADAs, these controllers, perform services for processes all across the United States of America. Now, what you've heard on the news is critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and that's a fact. It's a very important fact. But what I want you also to know is these controllers, these SCADAs, are also the center of gravity for America's transportation systems, Amtrak, rail, for factory floors, your Procter & Gamble's, your crafts, agriculture systems. They control elevators and buildings. They run roller coasters for theme parks, all across the United States. If one of these control systems got lost because of a snowstorm, human error, accidental threat, giant octopus coming across the ocean, 
the consequence is the same as it is for Stuxnet. I take my family to Disney World twice a year, and we travel all around the United States, and I feel some type of way about the lack of security of these control systems all across the United States. What is the next threat that we're talking about in America? Advanced persistent threat. This was a blow to America, and we're not talking about a mass Nigerian email scam sent out to thousands of people hoping a couple careless people will apply. We're talking about a very sneaky, unsophisticated attack, three and four steps in front of the actual target, where for four years, American companies had no clue what was leaving their environment. Imagine somebody coming to your house and every single month taking a piece of furniture with them. And you don't ask the question, what did they take? You ask the question, what didn't they take? They came into our house with honey on their fingers, and they walked out with whatever would stick. And every single year, six terabytes of data was stole from American companies. That's a lot of outbound connections. That's basic network security 101. We missed the mark. And I take back my comment about a piece of furniture every month. They took a piece of furniture every single day. Now, Security Mandia Company published in their report the APT1 attack cycle. And I concur with that report. That's the technical path for destruction. But what I want to tell you today, that's the exact same cycle that the KGB used in an old Cold War decades ago without using computers. That's the exact same cycle that the hijackers of 9-11 used for a decade prior to flying aircraft into the World Trade Center without using computers. And it's the same attack cycle that APT-1 used decades after the KGB using computers. And we failed to understand how our adversaries used the rate of technology against us. It's called a revolution of military affairs, military history 101. And we missed the mark, ladies and gentlemen. What's the next attack? This beautiful young lady, my wife, and 70 million other people from late November to mid-December of 2013, target stores. The system is called a point of sales. The process is called secured socket layer. And it's organic to every financial transaction that uses credit cards in the entire world. And when you go to check out at one of these point of sales, you use something called two-factor authentication. Your credit card is something you have. Your PIN number is something you know. And again, it's organic to every credit card transaction in the entire world. It has nothing to do with Target. The malware that was used in the Target attack is called a scraper. The adversary bought it on the Silk Road using something called Bitcoin for less than $2,000. Now, the point of sales device is really just a thin client with a slice of RAM. It's provisional. Imagine when you stand in front of a mirror, you can pull out your phone and take a picture of yourself. So when you put in your PIN number at any point of sales device, at any retail store, you're basically telling the bank that I'm right here, and I give you permission to dump all my personal information on this RAM. And the bank says, OK, and it sends all your information through a secure tunnel. Well, that defeats a man in the middle attack. But when it gets to the end of that secure tunnel, it's dumped unencrypted. And the adversary comes through with this malware called a scraper and scrapes it and clones it and phones home using file transfer protocol, which is unsecure, probably to two rogue servers in Denmark and Malaysia. Well, security experts have a solution for this. It's called Secured Electronic Transaction, SAT. And because this is true, that takes a gatekeeper and it puts it outside of the target enclave or any other retailer. And the request would go to the gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper would send a solution, approved or denied. And none of the PII would never go to the point of sales device. And if the point of sales device is compromised, the only thing the adversary would get would be approved or denied. He wouldn't get your social security number and your date of birth, and 70 million people wouldn't be compromised. Well, when Discover, MasterCard, and Visa and some retail giants were given this alternative solution for financial transactions, they gave pushback and said it's too demised, and why make all these changes? SSL works just fine. Well, 70 million people would disagree that SSL works just fine. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my opinion the reason why we're falling in cybersecurity is because we continue to want to use yesterday's security for today's emergent threats and technology. Organizations continue to want to focus on layer one through layer three of the OSI model. I have physical security and I have firewalls, so I have a silver bullet for, for cybersecurity. When the problem is with the system, 
the people in the process. It's referred to as the security triangle, as it applies through layer four through seven of the OSI model, integrated to what's called Open Web Application Security Protocol. The problem is with people, your Edward Snowdens of the world, and it has nothing to do with firewalls. The problem is with basic cyber hygiene. We don't do the little things right, and it has nothing to do with firewalls. 145 emails is passing through layer four through layer seven of the OSI model, represented with trillions of lines of code that all look like ones and zeros. And it has nothing to do with firewalls, and we keep missing the point. A blueprint for destruction is in the wild. You don't need a Chinese army or a state sponsor group or a million soldiers. All you need is a keyboard. A new Cold War is here. A race for cyber arms is on the way. And you better do something about it now. Thank you.